Harry Dent, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, nice to be here, Daniel. Uh, Harry, let's start um, off with the book. I, I I just finished it. It's a great book, one of, one of your best books, The Sale of a Lifetime, How the Great Bubble Burst of 2017 Can Make You Rich. I wanted to get an update from you on the book itself. Uh, you made some big calls in, for 2016 and 2017, and I just want to know, since writing it and since, since it's been published, uh, is there any changes you'd like to, to or, or updates you'd like to just note? Well, you know, I mean, we, we see this bubble that is the third bubble um, in the United States in stocks and financial assets. And, and this third bubble has been totally artificially created by quantitative easing, free money, zero interest rates, and now negative in most countries. This is an artificial bubble. We predicted back in the late 80s that Japan would collapse due to demographic trends, but the United States and Europe and most of the rest of the world would have the greatest boom in history. Nobody predicted that, but that's just demographics. The demographic trends in the United States peaked in late 2007, as we forecast, and ever since we've had endless quantitative easing to just print money, to make people feel richer, to goose up the stock markets, and this is not gonna last. So we're saying in this book that we're near the end of this artificial bubble, in stocks and in everything else, real estate's bounced back and and stuff. And we're going to see a bigger crash when this artificial bubble finally fails. And so you need to be very sensitive about your holdings of any financial assets outside of the most conservative bonds or cash. Everything's going to go down like it did in 2008 and 9. Stocks, commodities, real estate, everything's going to go down again and the next crash is going to be worse. So that's our view. This is a once in a lifetime, and I mean literally once in a lifetime back to the 1930s before we saw a major debt and financial asset bubble burst. And it was very painful when it happened for all financial assets outside of high quality bonds and for unemployment, business failures, bank failures, everything. That's what we're looking at. And nobody sees this. The, the, you know, the more I talk in the media about this bubble bursting, people say, oh, Harry, you're crazy. I'm like, no, you're crazy. This is the greatest bubble in history, especially in China, and it will burst and everything will go down and you have to protect yourself. That's the only strategy. Don't listen to your normal stockbroker and say, oh, I'm diversified. I'm OK. Diversification didn't protect you in 2008 crash. It will not protect you even more so this time. So we're just saying wake up. Protect yourself, and if the markets don't crash in the next year or so, then you can ignore what I say, but they are going to. Uh, Harry, one of the uh, things you recommend for protection is treasuries. Uh, you know, when you look at a chart from since 1980, you're an expert on bubbles, uh, but you're saying the treasuries are not in a bubble or that they're just the safe for the next, let's say, four or five years? No, actually, yeah, yeah, this is a great question because – Treasuries are in a bubble because central governments around the world have pushed them to artificially low interest rates, short and long term, especially long term, beyond the decline in inflation that we predicted decades ago. So bonds are in a short term bubble that will burst. So I don't want to buy even long term treasuries now. I want to buy short term treasuries, preserve my cash and value. And we're starting to get the spike in interest rates we predicted many months ago towards 3% in a 10-year Treasury bond because the world starts to worry even about sovereign bonds that have been way overbought by leveraged hedge fund traders and stuff and pushed down. But once the crisis happens, we will see deflation in prices like the 1930s and what we saw somewhat uh, years ago and bond and interest rates will go back down. Bonds will go up again, long-term bonds. So yes, in the 1930s, long-term treasury and corporate AAA bonds did the best in that decade by far when real estate and stocks were basically more down. But in this case, I would only buy the short-term bonds now. And if interest rates spike in the next six to nine months that we expect, maybe even 12, then I would buy the long-term treasuries and triple a corporates because they're the best 
defense against deflation, but I would not buy them now. Now, no one 10, 15 years ago could have predicted negative interest rates, which is essentially a default. Uh, you know, what measures, you know, I, I don't know, if, like, take me back to 2009. Could you, you know, with your models, could you have foreseen this massive quantitative easing? So I guess what I'm getting at is I totally see everything you're saying. It's all going to happen. It's all true. But then the asterisk is, what is the Fed going to do? Uh, are they going to do something that no one's even thought of? Where maybe it's not helicopter money. Maybe it's stealth bomber money dropping from the skies. Yeah, no, I mean, you're right about this. I mean, I knew that the central banks were going to stimulate the economy after 2008, 2009. I would have never forecast $12 trillion and growing of free money printed around the world by central banks to offset the natural deflation and deleveraging of debt and to prevent it from happening, which is very cowardly and very short-term thinking. I mean, ask any drug addict. What do they do? They think about the short term. I get, I, if I get high again, I'm fine. I'll worry about you know, detoxing or dying in the long term. That's what central banks are doing. This is disgusting, but it's what is happening. And, and it has been greater than either I or even the most liberal economists like Paul Krugman would have even thought of happening back in 2008-9. We would have thought this would have been a shorter term thing, but it is happening. So I've come to the simple conclusion that central banks have doubled down again and again on printing money, um, lower and, and zero and negative interest rates. And, and by the way, if zero interest rates were not enough to restart the global economy, <laughs> You have to go to negative? I mean, this is such a desperation move. But we're just saying that, yes, this has gone longer than even I would have expected, but it's getting very stretched. You have to note that the Chinese stock bubble just burst 50% late last year, and that was a response to the Chinese government to offset the real estate bubble slowing. And now the real estate bubble in China has gone off the roof, up 40 50% in the last year. The ultimate orgasmic bubble peak that we see in bubbles uh, in history and around the world. So to me, we're getting very close to the point where no matter how much central banks print money and lower interest rates, the economy is going to fail anyway because consumers and businesses already over borrowed in the bubble boom in 2007. And now they're trying to get them to do that more. And all they're really doing is inflating the bubbles and stocks and real estate, which will only burst and destroy the economy even more like 2008-9. So that's why we say, look, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. If you own real estate or stocks or any financial asset or even bonds right now, cash out, protect your profits and wait for, for this inevitable bubble one after the next to burst. And that's the whole theme of the sale of the lifetime that we're going to see in the next two, three, four, five years the greatest opportunity to buy financial assets and reinvest in businesses and everything, but you have to get out now or you won't have the assets to do it and no bank will lend you money to do it when it, that great opportunity occurs, like in 1932-33. Harry, when I, when I was reading your book, I definitely get the sense and, and found comfort in holding cash. Obviously, you, you guys recommend that. I I consider having a sizable cash position right now. I think you even mentioned this in your book is, you know, it's the safest way to short the stock market without actually shorting it, which is which could which could right. be dangerous. So, uh but I also read that and go, you know what? I also with with the banks and with the sovereigns and the negative interest rates, I also want to hold some gold. But you guys aren't recommending gold as an investment. Do you recommend people hold let's say 5-10% or are you saying no gold? Well, I would lean more towards no no gold, but gold is a good diversifier. But we're in a period like 2008 and 2009 where if we have another crash like that, and it will only be deeper because of putting it off and more stimulus and more debt, that everything goes down. I mean, people have to recall if you're a gold holder or silver, the gold went down 33%. In the second half of 2008, when Lehman Brothers went down and, and the worst of the crash happened, and silver went down 50%. They did not protect you. 
from that financial crisis. Gold is seen, obviously, as an inflation hedge, which I agree 120% with, but we're not dealing with inflation here. We've printed more money in the world than any time in history, and inflation's only gone sideways to down. We're fighting deflation. Gold is not a deflation hedge. It's an inflation hedge. But also, when people tell me, oh, it's a crisis hedge, like, well, what worse crisis have we had since late 2008 when the financial system around the world blew up with Lehman Brothers and stuff going down? Gold went down 33%. The U.S. dollar went up 27%, the opposite of what the gold bugs said would happen. They said the dollar would crash in a crisis and gold would go up. So, again, we told people a year ago that gold had been oversold after we predicted it would crash. It, you know, it oversold at 1,050. It would bounce towards 1,400. And it's done that. And I would say this is a good time to sell gold and not own gold because gold bubbled up even more than stocks from 2001 to 2011. And it, and like most commodities that have been crashing, gold is going to crash as well. In deflationary era, if this was in a big crisis like the 70s, it'd be all over gold. It's not. I think gold's going to keep going down and it's bounced about as much as I think it will, which is a darn good second time to sell gold than the first time we recommended in late April of uh, 2011 when silver retested its all-time high at $49. That's when we said, get out of gold and silver, and it's been down ever since. Harry, what about the flow of capital? Because I know volume ultimately moves stocks, and I look at the uh, the mining sector specifically, which has gone absolutely ballistic on this relatively small move in gold, about 20 25%. But the mining shares are up big. I've talked to some of these guys who've been in it for decades. I'm sure you know all these people as friends, uh, as people you speak with them in conferences all around the world. Um, you know, these people are looking at this. They're like, look, we, we had a five-year bear market that was unprecedented. And now the money, the big money from China, from Korea, from all around the world is flooding and flowing back into the sector. Uh, you know, is it possible that just a, a, a cyclical bull market um, inside of the the mining sector uh, could happen, or do you think that it gold, if gold goes down, it cannot overcome that and it will reverse? Yeah, how, how could you overcome that? My target in the next few years is seven hundred dollars on gold, and ultimately back to where the bubble started in late two thousand five to four hundred dollars, give or take. I mean. How can the mining sector do well if that occurs? Um, so, yes, I, I know there's all these arguments. Oh, China's buying gold. Russia's buying gold. That is nothing. The people who buy gold in the world are Chinese and freaking Indians. Indians wear gold in more places we can imagine. And those economies are slowing. And China's going to have the biggest bubble burst of any country in all of modern history by our forecast. That is not good for gold. Now. On the flip side of that, though, if gold does go down to these levels and does see its bubble erased back down to $400 or lower, I would buy gold hand and fist because the next global boom is not going to be uh, dominated by um, uh, developed countries like the U.S. and Europe and Japan and, and stuff. It's going to be dominated by emerging countries who have the strong demographics, the strong urbanization potential that we no longer have in the developed world. And these people are huge commodity consumers and huge gold consumers and silver. So if gold and silver do go down as low as I think, that would be probably my number one buy along with Indian stocks for the decades to come. But I'm waiting on that. I This is not the time to buy gold, and it's already bounced as much or close to as much as we expected. So I see much more downside for a few years. And then incredible upside. We could see gold at three to five pounds 20 years from now. But shit, I'll be dead by then, you know? <laughs> well, let's hope not. There's a life expectancy is way longer than it was for our parents and grandparents. On the, uh, mill uh, on the millennials, um, your models, I've, I've, I've always been fascinated. I've always enjoyed... Uh, looking at that, it's so logical. It makes sense if you'd ask anybody who 
has gone through you know their 20s all the way to their 60s or you look at your own life i'm in my 30s right now it all just lines up but the millennial specifically which i'm on the tail end or the, i guess i'm in the front end of the millennial generation but the millennials are definitely not they're not following those footsteps of the boomers so are you guys changing or updating your models or or how does that how does that uh change your 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 models and your forecasts uh you know going forward like say it's like say 10 20 years from now millennials aren't getting married when the baby boomers got married they're not having the kids they're not even buying the homes yeah no no i mean i i have touted for a long time that every other generation is the opposite the baby boomers were more innovative throw out the baby with the bath water change everything from the 60s forward when they started entering the workforce and that's what they've done the millennials are more like the Bob Hope generation that just makes everything a little better. They don't take as big risk, and they've they've grown up in a time where the economy has been more volatile and negative, including real estate prices. So they think differently, and they will continue to, but they're going to have their spending wave from 2023 to 2055. Um and it'll be stronger in the U.S. than most developed countries, but weaker, much weaker than in emerging countries. So that's where the great dynamic comes from investing. But yes, the millennial generation is different, is is as large at its peak as the baby boom, which is which it is not in most developed countries. So we're lucky here. But it will not generate a boom of anywhere near the magnitude of 1983 to 2007. And these people are going to be more conservative about buying houses and making major innovations. They're just going to improve everything. So it's a natural trend, and and the world will not be the same in the millennial generation boom as it was in the baby boom. We've already seen, and, we, and I said that from the beginning in the late 80s in my books, not only was Japan going to collapse while the rest of the world boomed greater than ever, this was going to be the greatest boom in modern western developed and u.s history and we will not see a boom like that to replace this because our demographics continue to slow and they'll slow even more after the millennial generation as births and immigration currently as we predicted also 20 years ago are dropping because of the slowing economy and will drop more and that means even less demographic growth for the next generation after the millennials so we're looking at a slowing U.S. and developed economy, uh, a, you know, world for decades to come, not just the next more severe three to six years. Uh, everyone, make sure you go to the links we'll set up for you. Uh, the sale of a lifetime. You can get it at the sale of a lifetime dot com. We'll have that link. And then, Harry, if somebody wants to subscribe to your daily alerts or get premium content from you, um, that it, that would be very prudent for them to do in times like these. Where's the best place for them to subscribe? Yeah, just go to harrydent.com. We have a free daily newsletter, six days a week, with comments from me and our best experts at Dent Research. And, and that's a way to get to, to know us better because, you know, you know, we are saying something radically different. But I think the more you listen to us, you'll understand we see things that most economists and politi political experts do not see. And they're real and they're projectable. You're good, man, Harry. Uh, in closing, any uh, uh, any predictions for the uh, 2016 election? Yes. I mean, I I've said for many months before Trump stumbled here that if Trump loses, he wins because he's really starting a political movement against the mainstream. And he'd be better to do that as a, a pundit on a new news station, which he could create with his partners, Roger Ailes and Breitbart News. And if Hillary wins, she will wish she had lost because she's going to walk into the worst economy in our lifetimes, as opposed to her husband, Bart Simpson, I call him. She's Lisa, mm -hmm. who walked into the best economy in our lifetimes in, in early 1993. And of course, we predicted that in our first book, The Great Boom Ahead, before Bill Clinton walked in, we predicted we're going to have the greatest boom in history and the government budget would be balanced by 1998, which it was. He had nothing to do with that, even though he wasn't a bad president. But I'm saying Hillary's going to get severely punished if she wins. I'd rather be Trump right now, despite all of his negative media. Yeah, it's true. I mean, he's already rich. He's going to just go back to enjoying a, a good life. This happens.
we will see deflation in prices like the 1930s and what we saw somewhat uh, years ago. And bond and interest rates will go back down. Bonds will go up again, long-term bonds. So, yes, in the 1930s, long-term Treasury and corporate AAA bonds did the best in that decade by far when real estate and stocks were basically more down. But in this case, I would only buy the short-term bonds now. And if interest rates spike in the next six to nine months that we expect, maybe even 12, then I would buy the long-term treasuries and AAA corporates because they're the best defense against deflation. But I would not buy them now. Now, no one 10, 15 years ago could have predicted negative interest rates, which is essentially a default. Uh, you know, what measures, you know, I, I don't know, if, like, take me back to 2009. Could you, you know, with your models, could you have foreseen this massive quantitative easing? So I guess what I'm getting at is I totally see everything you're saying. It's all going to happen. It's all true. But then the asterisk is, going to. Uh, Harry, one of the uh, things you recommend for protection is treasuries. Uh, you know, when you look at a chart from since 1980, you're an expert on bubbles. Uh, but you're saying the treasuries are not in a bubble or that they're just the safe for the next, let's say, four or five years? No, actually, yeah. Yeah, this is a great question because treasuries are in a bubble because central governments around the world have pushed them to artificially low interest rates, short and long term, especially long term, beyond the decline in inflation that we predicted decades ago. So bonds are in a short-term bubble that will burst. So I don't want to buy even long-term treasuries now. I want to buy short-term treasuries, preserve my cash and value, and we're starting to get the spike in interest rates we predicted many months ago towards 3% in a 10-year treasury bond because the world starts to worry even about sovereign bonds that have been way overbought by leveraged hedge fund traders and stuff and push down. But once the crisis bonds or cash, everything is going to go down like it did in 2008 and 2009. Stocks, commodities, real estate, everything is going to go down again, and the next crash is going to be worse. So that's our view. This is a once-in-a-lifetime, and I mean literally once-in-a-lifetime, back to the 1930s before we saw a major debt and financial asset bubble burst. And it was very painful when it happened for all financial assets outside of high quality bonds and for unemployment, business failures, bank failures, everything. That's what we're looking at. And nobody sees this. The, the, you know, the more I talk in the media about this bubble bursting, people say, oh, Harry, you're crazy. I'm like, no, you're crazy. This is the greatest bubble in history, especially in China, and it will burst and everything will go down, and you have to protect yourself. That's the only strategy. Don't listen to your normal stockbroker and say, oh, I'm diversified, I'm okay. Diversification didn't protect you in 2008 crash. It will not protect you even more so this time. So we're just saying wake up, protect yourself, and if the markets don't crash in the next year or so, then you can ignore what I say, but they are going. Of people... The research they've done there, there really is there. There is no second. There's just it's Harry Dent's research. That's who people use. Uh, in fact, even people who don't give him credit, I know where those charts come from because I reread Harry's stuff. So, uh, want to just really encourage everybody to make sure you go out and buy the book. We'll have a link to his website as well. This is definitely somebody you want to be listening to, even if you know you have a disagreement with him because he has some very bold calls here that many people might not like. But his research. I mean, it doesn't get any better. Harry Dent, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, nice to be here, Daniel. Uh, Harry, let's start um, off with the book. I, I, I just finished it. It's a great book, one, one of your best books, The Sale of a Lifetime, How the Great Bubble Burst of 2017 Can Make You Rich. I wanted to get an update from you on the book itself. Uh, you made some big calls in, for 2016 and 2017. And I just want to know, since writing it and since, since it's been published, uh, is there any changes you'd like to, to or, or updates you'd like to just note? Well, you know, I mean, we, we see this bubble that is the third bubble um, in the United States in stocks and financial assets. And, and this third bubble has been totally artificially created by 
quantitative easing, free money, zero interest rates, and now negative in most countries. This is an artificial bubble. We predicted back in the late 80s that Japan would collapse due to demographic trends, but the United States and Europe and most of the rest of the world would have the greatest boom in history. Nobody predicted that, but that's just demographics. The demographic trends in the United States peaked in late 2007, as we forecast, and ever since we've had endless quantitative easing to just print money, to make people feel richer, to goose up the stock markets, and this is not going to last. So we're saying in this book that we're near the end of this artificial bubble in stocks and in everything else. Real estate's bounced back and, and stuff. And we're going to see a bigger crash when this artificial bubble finally fails. And so you need to be very sensitive about your holdings of any financial assets outside of the most conservative